Who wants to start a company? Are you guys crazy? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll ask that question again after I'm done, okay? Mm -hmm. who, who wants to join a small company? Okay? Who wants to join a large company? I want to retire. <laughs> so, no, that, that, that's good. That's helpful. So, um, anytime interrupt uh, if you have any questions or if you want to challenge anything that I say, that's uh, all in the cards. So, um, the organizers asked me to sort of talk a little bit how I got here, which is not, which is not a very straightforward line, as you can see. So, I grew up in, in trained in, uh, in Germany. Biochemist by training, a PhD in uh, molecular neurobiology. And then got a postdoc fellowship to come to UCSF and was at that time very committed to be an academic researcher in basic neuroscience. I worked on uh, glutamate receptors and uh, wanted to study sort of biology and physiology of glutamate receptors. Um, well, after six months uh, into that, I realized that this is not really what I meant to do. And so I, I basically left. Um, I was really lucky to get in contact with a um, former postdoc of my mentor back in, in, in Germany who was working at a company called Links. And uh, Links doesn't exist anymore, this is not the multiple mergers. Uh, uh, Solera and then later on Illumina. So it was at the time where high throughput sequencing was something pretty cool. It wasn't done, there was no human genome. And Links was building technology to do what they call massive parallel signature sequencing, which is essentially high throughput transport form analysis. Um, was at the time a huge machine that didn't work, and uh, people were doing the technology development, and, and I was part of the neuroscience group that was um, that wanted to apply that technology first to Alzheimer's disease and other neurological disorders. Um, so the only constant in small companies is change. And as it happens in many technology companies, things didn't go that well. So for a little longer, it was a little bit more expensive. And the leadership of the company said, look, we got to sort of focus, focus, focus. And we cannot afford doing a lot of neuroscience here left and right. Um, so longer term, you guys need to integrate yourself somewhere into the deep squad of establishing the technology or do something else. And we decided to do something else, namely to spin off the company, AGY Therapeutics. Um, AGY is, does anybody speak Hungarian here? AGY is OG, and it's the brain in Hungarian. Because the co founder, my boss at the time, uh, is Hungarian. Uh, we were very lucky we got Bob Swanson, the founder of Genentech, involved, who wrote the first check. And we incorporated the company in his office in. Uh, in San Mateo, worked out of his office in San Mateo for a while, raised $15 million in a matter of a few weeks, putting to get the PowerPoint slides together quickly enough as the money came in, because if you have Bob Swanson as your acting CEO, you're set, right? This is it. This is the real deal. We were written up at Genentech 2. <coughs> well, AGI isn't around anymore. It didn't come to Genentech 2. Lesson number one, execution matters. So we were riding the neurogenomics wave, we were identifying targets that were incredibly interesting, discovering novel biology and this and that, but um, we didn't really get to compounds because we didn't think that that was so important. Well, it turns out that there's something called the Board of Directors that feels that this is very, very important that you get to do <coughs> compounds and you get to certain milestones and to partnering endpoints that they can get the return on their investment. So at some point, and, and that's maybe another of these experiences, you start with a team of people and they all like each other, um, that not necessarily lasts for 10 years or more. It lasted for four. And so then many people went different ways, and uh, I decided to be involved in another startup company uh, called Envivo Pharmaceuticals still neuroscience, uh, doing small molecule discovery using uh, genetically altered uh, Drosophila. So the idea being if you put a human disease gene into a Drosophila, whether it's Parkin or, or uh, the Huntington gene or something like that, those flies get a neurological phenotype. 
and they get different than the old Alzheimer's flying. So the Parkinson's flying is different from the Alzheimer's flying, is different from the Huntington's flying. And then you can build a big machine um, and essentially spread. And it looked whether you can find compounds that, um, that improve the phenotype of this fly, and some of them might do this in mice, and some of them might do that in humans. That was the idea. You can imagine how people looked at that when they came and said, We have flies, and we want to cure Alzheimer's disease. Um, that was already surprised, what was even worse is our first day, and I'm not kidding, first day of fundraising for this company, Samsung, so was September 12, 2001. Not a good day. Not a good day to raise money, not a good day to talk to people about sort of what the next years will bring. So at the end, we, we managed to raise uh, $12 million that came with a couple of strings attached, namely that the company moved to Boston. Um, I grew up in high school winters, I didn't have to have that again. So I stayed here, um, and then said like, yeah, maybe we're gonna take a break from this kind of entrepreneurial activities and join the company, uh, Sages Pharmaceuticals. Well, it was very attractive. It was the most successful biotech in Half Moon Bay. And, um, how many are there? Okay. Um, so Sages was doing drug development. But I also felt it's important at some point you gotta sort of move along the value chain, right? You can't be all the time basic biology, preclinical pharmacology, but you gotta learn something about how it works. Right? So you know these little details like a clinical trial, an IND, uh, an NDA, what do you need to convince the FDA to get approval, what do you need to then convince other people to actually pay for it. Uh, and that was a good learning opportunity. Um, until uh, the first, so we had two drugs, one being licensed from, uh, from Switzerland, one from Italy. The first one was in phase two for an Alzheimer's study. The second one was in phase one for uh, the study in uh, cognitive impairment associated with schizophrenia, obviously, at the end. Uh, the first one failed, and guess what happened? The board of directors looked at us and said, boys and girls, they won't work. Um, and in hindsight, I think it was pretty stupid because the, the second, the CIS drug right now is the front runner in a phase three trial that might be the next uh, proof of Alzheimer's therapeutics. But, you know, people decide based on business interests and not necessarily on where the science is and where the science makes sense. So at that point, I said, like, enough of this neuroscience stuff. I gotta do something else. Uh, I went into uh, a company here just a mile away from here called the Bavarian Medical Systems, that is in, in radiation oncology. It's, um, it's a software and device company, and the idea was that um, doing something completely different would be kind of a cool experience. Um, the funny thing is what I did after a year being there and enjoying the cool experiences, I started to work on spinning off the company. But I think I got sort of a little itchy about well, this is all too slow. There's a lot of physics, by the way, which I don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's one of the company called Centella Therapeutics um, that was sort of developing drugs in combination with radiotherapy, which is also a little bit a new idea. So you see the trend, right? New ideas are attractive, are cool, but I've got to be damn careful around them because um, what you typically need to do at some point, you need to raise money. And uh, while every single investor is telling you that they are looking for new ideas, that is not necessarily true. Or, I mean, new is not black and white, right? And that's sort of a gradient. And if you're not hitting on the right spot of this gradient, right? You know, somewhat new, but maybe not too new, then it's also difficult. So, um, despite a lot of efforts, I was not able to, or we were not able to raise enough money to really take this on the road and really build a company around it. And in hindsight, maybe it wasn't enough for the company, maybe it was more a project, which is also something that, that I think we need to discuss in a little bit more detail, like what is, what is a project versus what is a company. Um, and then I was lucky that J&J Open the innovation centers, and uh, 
have been working in Dano for a little over two and a half years. I'm not itching to start another company right now, but I know that I'm doing it. Um, and so I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about J and J. I think we can do this another time or you guys come come by and do it. But bottom line is J and J largest healthcare company in the world, not only pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals is one out of three sectors um, under the name Janssen here in the US. Uh, and then uh, devices and diagnostics and consumer healthcare products. <laughs> I was, I was totally amazed when I visited corporate headquarters in New Jersey for the first time back at the Johnson & Johnson store. And I bet you that each and everybody of you is using at least one J&J product without really knowing it. Neutrogena, Band-Aid, all this kind of good stuff. Um, 125,000 people are probably over 30,000 in R&D. However, Compared to what is going on worldwide in R&D, this is tiny, tiny, right? And so the, the idea, the basic premise behind j and innovation is we got to reach out into the world. The world is our laboratory, and a good idea can come from anywhere. And so we are sort of the eyes and ears for j and to interact with academic institutions, to interact with small companies, to help start small companies, to help finance small companies, Whatever is sort of happening outside the R&D um, space of change. So that's me. Now comes the question. So you really want to be an entrepreneur. So what you need, you need the fire in the belly, you need obviously the brains, um, and you also need the social skills to accomplish the list of things that are impossible to accomplish. So it starts from typically you get some IP that is suboptimal, so you gotta fix that. You gotta revise the budget that somebody put on a piece of paper and it's completely wrong. You gotta complete some sort of a business plan, you build your network, you gotta get the right members of the board involved, get your proof of concept data on the side, um, hire the right team, close your licenses, close your financing, think about how you partner and how you recruit some advisors and how you work with people. So, um, I don't know about you, but I need to sleep a couple of hours a night, and this is a really, very, very long list. However, as we all know, there are the Googles and the Facebooks and the Genentechs and the Amgens and uh, the XLXs and the Onyx, so people do this. But I think people do this in a way that they really, number one, know what they're getting into, and number two, can sort of dissect this unbelievable list that is not, that a single person cannot accomplish into sort of different compartments and then work it off like a giant to do list. And so I think that the three main topics, I want to just talk a couple of minutes about that, that it is, I feel like, the most important ones. So the people, the ability to raise financing. Um, because we are unfortunately not in a, like an iPhone app world where friends and family can get you enough money and sort of feed you for six months and then you have something that might be an accidental acquisition. Unfortunately, a drug is 12 years and a billion dollars and that's very little really to show you off. That's just what it is. And so you are working on slightly different capital requirements, which also means you have a couple of more over. Uh, overseers of all of your activities. It's not mom and dad who ask you at night, like, so how do you go today? But it's your board of directors and your investors that will want to see execution. So there's probably 20 more aspects that one could talk about in Japan, if you want any time. But I think those three are really the ones that are most important. Um, so people always say it's all about people. Well, that's not true. It's all about the right people. And so um, when one gets into that, and I'm not really trying to scare you, but uh, when one gets into this, this is sort of a pretty amazing world I've used. Some in the audience have got the shooting already, and have hopefully learned something from that, and will try it again. And I think that there is sort of a, a type of person that just is an entrepreneur. I don't think you can learn that. But it's either in your genetic code or it's not. 
And if it's not, that's perfectly fine. Um, there is uh, a role for everybody in personal and professional life. But I think if it is, then it is almost like a fire in the valley of birch that you almost can't resist. Um, it is an amazing time to start a company. I went through this now three times. But it is also an amazing roller coaster. And so this might sound stupid and trivial, but it's, it's really true. This is a time of extreme high demand. And if you don't really watch carefully around sort of friends and families, your work life balance, like the guy who just convinced me that he gets an appointment with J&J, is saying, I'm now going to the gym, which is great. He wanted to talk to me for three minutes, he got this done, he's going to the gym. Perfect. Um, those are really, really important things. And, and you, you typically don't hear the stories of entrepreneurs getting depressed or jumping off riches or whatever happens, but these things happen. Um, and I think it's extremely important to really be prepared for it and sort of build the team around you that, that supports you uh, in, in those things. And maybe everything goes, goes right if you, I mean, we raised money once in four weeks. It was unbelievable. There was zero stress. But that is not the typical experience. And then I think um, <coughs> that also as you build a team around you, it's, it's really important that these are people that you like and you think you can work with. And if you hire people, and this is now mostly sort of from the perspective when you are starting a company, you're really going to do your homework, interview extremely carefully. Um, and I think that's also something that one needs to learn. I don't think, I mean, I know it from my experience, I did a couple of terrible hiring mistakes. Um, I can't guarantee that this will never ever happen again today, but I think it's less likely to happen today because I learned how to interview people. And there's absolutely nothing wrong to ask somebody whom you know well, um, hey, can you meet with this candidate? Um, maybe even over lunch or coffee or something, and just bring the gut check. We do this all the time. Um, and check references, and obviously the references that are not in the resume are the ones you can check, right? Not the ones that are listed. They won't tell you the greatest thing on the planet. Um, LinkedIn is a great tool. Anyway, um, and I think those, those high standards you need to have for absolutely everybody involved. Um, it needs to be people who you also personally like because you will spend quite a lot of time together. Um, and if it doesn't work, if it really doesn't work, and it's great. And there's absolutely nothing wrong. Um, it's not the most comfortable discussion, but there is nothing wrong with sitting down and having a discussion and saying, hey, Joe, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work for the company. In most of the cases, when you really probe, it also doesn't work for that person. And then you can, you can always come up with a scenario where you separate in peace if, if it's one of your co-founders, if that person a decent um, share allocation in the company, under some resting schedule, do a properly drafted separation agreement, um, don't talk badly about each other, and move on. Never forget that that normally could be an adventure capital company in five years where you are pitching for your uh, Series B investment that you absolutely need to continue. This, this Silicon Valley is unbelievably small. Right? So that's also something that, that uh, quite honestly, I needed to learn. I don't piss people off. You, you see them. And typically, in situations where you are not expecting that, and then it's like, oops. So, no, but, but I think it's, it's really true. In particular, the, the last point, um, that I'm thinking and looking back, um, we often sort of didn't hold a plot really enough. And there is nothing more destructive than the person who's not a team player and, and who. So that doesn't go along with what the company really wants and needs to do. So it takes a village to build a company. And, and I think you need a lot of people um, whom you typically maybe not necessarily interact with. Um, maybe here at, at Stanford, you see scientists, you see your clinicians. But you need more than that. You need lawyers, you need business people, 
um, you need finance people, and all of them have to work sort of somehow together to, to give a whole picture of that really works. And you don't need to know everything. You need to know a little bit of everything, and you don't need to know absolutely everything. The other risk, and I've seen that many times, is you have sort of the, the super smart founding CEO who thinks that he or she got to do it all, A through Z, every day. That doesn't work. It doesn't work from a workload perspective, but it also doesn't work uh, at some point for sort of the, the other team members because they say like, hey, what, what the heck? Why, why are we here? What are we doing? So you're going to really orchestrate um, the way you want to have it. Let me pause here for questions. It's really encouraging. Any question? Yeah. So on this point, I mean, how do you actually go about finding your group, especially once the skills are very diverse you might not be you know, Network, network, network. You are, I would say, globally in the best spot in the world to build a company. You have the best law firms around here. You have the best sort of professional organizations, starting with this one. Be a member of Bay Bio, go to all of these uh, of, um, drug to device summit, and this and this. I mean, you could be out there every single evening, meeting people, talking to people who have done it before. Then there is, you gotta have sort of one or two real key senior business advisors, and they can be a clinician by training, but somebody who has been in the industry. <laughs> and who has connections. And you will you will see this is sort of this entrepreneurial virus that then spreads around. You go and say, I need the chief medical officer, I don't need the person full time, but I need somebody who is a medical oncologist, has filed INDs, and has worked with big pharma companies. You have the right connections in the Nevada, you have five names within one hour. You meet them and see who is compatible with you. Who has a price tag that is affordable, and you um, get that question. So, in terms of finding people that you can work with, it seems like it's a, a balancing act. That if it's people that you know, that you know that you can work with or that you're friends with, they also might be the people who think very similarly to you. Yeah. And so, they might not be the right people because you can get a blind leading the blind situation. So, if you're working with people that you don't know, what's the best way of figuring out if you can work with them? Work with them. And you don't need to hire somebody as a full time employee, co founder, give him 10% of your company. Say, like, look, this is a three month trial period. Um, you sign a consulting agreement, that's something that you need because of so intellectual property and all of these things. And then work very closely to that. <coughs> Maybe with sort of the perspective of, look, if this works out, um, yeah, you could be my chief technical officer, but maybe it doesn't work out, and then we'll separate as friends. I think this, and, and this is also great here, that people don't necessarily expect that you hire them full time and pay them twenty fifty thousand dollars base salary. Right? In this kind of entrepreneurial community, people um, sort of understand the rules of the game and and buy into it. And if not, maybe that's not the right person. Financing. So, financing, in my personal experience, and, and also looking at a lot of companies, is probably the stumbling block number one. And in particular, if you are um, trying to develop therapeutics, without financing, it just won't work. Right? I mean, if you just sort of add up the, the cost that you are looking at to advance your idea, or maybe it is even a very, very early molecule that you get out of this or another university, to sort of a real partnering endpoint. So if you just look at, let's say, early molecule to phase two completion, on average, you are looking at like between 30 and 50 million. Um, if you have this in your bank account, right, you don't need to worry about financing, but most of the people don't. So you need to worry about financing. 
Um, so financing is also one of these things that there is not sort of one law in USC and that, that will serve everybody. Um, there is no standard, but one thing that I'm seeing sometimes that people don't really consider well enough is you got to have something that can be financed, right? And having something that can be financed is also a little bit a function of time. Um, let's say 10 years ago, if you could pronounce the word genomics, you were already almost financed. Today, okay, that's the point. Today, you basically have to have or significant finance in either some sort of brand new technology, or you're going to have a molecule where you can say we are going to file an R&D in whatever, 6 to 12 months, and here's the plan, and this is how much it costs, and this is the immediate process. So the, and maybe in, in two years it's different again. So this is also something where you need to have like the ear on the ground and talk to your advisors. And, and again, lawyers here in Silicon Valley are not only lawyers, they have great business advisors. I have gotten the best advice, among the best advisors, from sort of my, my lawyers in the past, whether it's uh, Wilson Sonsini or Udi or Fainway, that there's lots of really great firms out here with people. Many of them even have a PhD degree, so they also really understand the science and they can help you know, in developing your new business. Um, then I, I, I think you gotta essentially, out of necessity, consider any and every pathway from angels, VCs, grants, foundations, <coughs> any pictures thereof. You gotta get to your number. Of course, you first gotta know what this number is. So that's a little bit sort of the business plan. And the, the number differs if you want to do a major oncology therapeutic or if you want to do the next step in a cool technology platform or a diagnostic. But there are all these milestones that um, one can figure out how much it costs. And but you also you cannot run into a venture capital office and say, here's my cool idea, um, can I get funding? Because they want to know exactly what you have and where do you want to drive it and what are you offering in the future. Um, this whole idea of networking, in particular in venture capital, is unbelievably important. Um, because odds are that maybe your first company is not your last, and you will go to the same people again. Uh, it is all network driven. Um, what I always say is if, if you cannot send an email directly to the managing director of the venture firm, don't email. This info at venturefund.com, uh, it's typically an auto forward in the trash. It's, it's that. And I mean, we have that stuff as well. Somebody looks at it, it's not that bad. But um, at, at, at the end of the day, if you don't have a personal introduction or you know the person from the past, it is less and less likely that, that, you, uh, that, you, that you even get through the door to present your case. And that's how it is, it's like climbing up a ladder. You first have to get through the door to present your case. You typically get 45 minutes an hour. Um, and then those people decide, well, is it worthwhile to spend the next three hours or not? And then at that three hour meeting, is it worthwhile to spend 20 hours or something? Um, they will all tell you that they have hundreds of business plans, which I don't know, I'm not in their business. I'm assuming it's probably true. So you have to somehow rise above the noise. And the best way to rise above the noise is if you know that person already, or if you know somebody who knows, and can, can say, hey, I met with Joe, and Joe has this great idea for this novel oncology therapeutic, you should really need this job. You do it all. Um, you gotta practice your pitch. This is also something, I mean, most of you are scientists by, by training, sort of this, um, the venture pitch is not a scientific lecture. Okay, so we gotta really, and, and this is again where advisors come in where you can practice it and uh, and keep your, your stuff up. And and finally, if you're if you're almost there, then one of the last stumbling blocks that many people can, in my personal opinion, make a big mistake is if it's about this dilution thing. Sort of like these evil venture guys want 51% of my company. Well, that's how the business model works. And 
most of the times in my biotech, this is non-negotiable. This is just what it is. And I wouldn't be afraid of it because guess what? At the end of the day, there are more or less sort of standard rules where the founding CEO should end up or where a vice president of research should end up at the, uh, at the exit event. And, and I think that's the strongest argument, it's anyhow very binary, right? You either win or you lose. There is very little in between. And whether you own 4% or 5% of a $2 billion company, never happened to me, but I don't think I would care. But it is one of those sort of testing points when, when it gets into term sheet uh, discussions, this whole dilution thing. And in my mind, people get far too much hung up on that. And mm -hmm. I think always it's much more important to get the right investors than the investors who give the sort of the best uh, terms. Um, business plan. So you need a business plan. Now, the good news is the business plan is not this kind of two-inch thick word document anymore, but the business plan is the same thing as like that. That's it. And then there's typically your pitch deck, which is like maybe 30 minutes or 30 slides, 25 slides, and then there, there is a backup of more data. And then when the fund enters into the diligence, if they really start to grow deep, they will tell you exactly what they want. Um, and you will provide that, that material because they need to put it all together. Um, what, what people don't very often do is really make it simple and present a really simple pitch. You need to demonstrate significant medical and commercial need. Just that one could do something is simply not enough. Right? Where is the clinical need? Um, why would it be commercially successful? Why should somebody care and why should somebody pay for that? And it doesn't have to be super fancy. Don't try to impress the, the um, MIT, PhD, MBA, JD in the audience because they pretty not exist. But make it simple. For me, the golden rule has always been I'm trying to communicate to this managing director of venture fund X something that when he or she comes home and the family asks, so what did you do today? There needs to be the one liner. A very, very simple message. We are the company that dot dot dot. That's it. If you get that across in the first meeting, and if you can demonstrate to them that you have assembled the DC team, that you know the space and this and that, that's it. Don't try to sort of load absolutely everything on those people because they very often sit through like four or five presentations in one day. So they can't remember all of that. And your job is to make it easy for them to remember and to get it off the line. You need to help them to understand why your product or your technology is different. They, they know that space relatively well. And if you come in and say, oh, we, we have a new starter. Well, that's kind of cool. There's already six on the market and five of them are generic. So what's cool? Or we have a new treatment for breast cancer. Well, there's already 15 on the market and 72 in clinical development. So you gotta really sort of, in simple words, convey the message what is different and why would it have uh, success for it. And you gotta put all of that into an operational plan. And I always feel that that is one of the things that is the most important to really make clear how do you jump over these hurdles, your technical risk. Fair, I mean, it's fair, and the most things fair. Um, what is your operational risk, regulatory risk, market risk? And it can be just a couple of bullets or a little picture or anything on each of them, but they all need to be addressed because people ask. Um, and then a few anecdotes. So if you say we don't have competitors that were open and we are out, because that's impossible. Or it means that you're working on something that is so uninteresting that nobody else ever had thought of. Another thing, we don't know how much money we need. Yeah, we can need to know that. Or when it gets into the team kind of aspect, um, in particular, first time entrepreneurs, maybe a little bit younger, you gotta show a certain degree of flexibility. Right? Because at the end of the day, 
investors invest also to a large extent into people. And there is absolutely nothing wrong in being whatever the founder and initial CEO of the company and then step into VP research or whatever. If that secures the financing, if that gets the company off the ground, um, that's great. And learning a lot in this first company and then maybe in the second or the third, then having enough experience to be the CEO, uh, it's also not, not too bad. Um, you have to be able to talk about this without the CBA. So you can't go into a venture office and say, hey, give me money, but I can't tell you for what. Because it's so secretive. I can't tell you, I have to shoot you. It doesn't work. It's just because the, the people have enough opportunities that they say, like, uh, this guy is too complicated. Why, why not? They, they, they want it. Or another classic is um, if there's big pharma one or multiple on a different uh, on the same target already in the clinic and you cannot articulate very very clearly why you believe that you have an unbelievable almost unbeatable competitive advantage. As I said we have thirty thousand people in R and Pfizer are the same and approach. And those people are not stupid. They are only stupid people, but most of them are not and they are very driven and they have unbelievable resources. If you walk through one of ours or Lilly's or Pfizer's R&D departments, there is no shortage in anything that is not related to that. So if the pharma company is significantly ahead of you, that is one of these points to really pause and think, is there enough here for a company? Last, execution. Um, so that, that's also something that in a lot of small companies, it, it's not that popular, right? It, it's more sort of cool to talk about my, my great science and, and my new technology and look how much money I will make. Um, but that's not what, what it is. Like, I, I would say in hindsight, the first startup that I was involved in AGY failed based on execution. Because we just didn't have a plan or something enough to our technology and what we can do and look how cool it, that we just didn't really commit to really very well and go and make the decision points. It was also at a time where, where venture capital was somehow in a different place. I don't think that really happens today anymore because you will have a board that is guiding you much more. Um, the risk is very often if you don't really have this plan in place, you will even get to your company creation. Um, what I also found useful is to invest in sort of some tools to help you because um, it is not the most fascinating thing to move M charts from the left and to the right, but it is unbelievably important. And there are, again, Silicon Valley, there are people whom you can hire for four hours a week to do exactly that. They come in, we have those people all the time, they come in and they sort of do a little uh, question and answer session, and then you get by email your GAN chart with all of your milestones and dollar figures and this and that, and you can go publicly to the board of directors and say, here, here it is. Um, and you don't need to go to work. Um, and I think you, you also need to internally, that, that's sort of a little bit the risk which comes to what, what you said, internally sort of reflect a couple of times, like are we really on track? Like one of, one of the stories that I always found uh, very instructional is during World War II, Winston Churchill had a couple of people in on his staff whose role was only to sit the whole, the whole week in meetings and listen and talk to people. And on Friday, they would come to him only to report the worst of the worst that occurred during the week because he wanted to know. Right? And there's sometimes a little bit in the sort of uh, passion of running this company, the tendency to sort of let's forget about the, the bad stuff. No, we need to address it right now because the bad stuff uh, can kill you if you don't get it under control. So then the, the other thing is who, who, who's actually the customer? Because most of the times, as a small entrepreneur company, you actually will not drive your product to the market. 
I got the Hawk 12 years in Berlin, and I had lost it a little bit cheaper technology platform as well. But the typical biotech business model is you take something from academia, you provide human proof of concept, and then you take it over to one of the big banks. Um, whether it's it's J and J or Pfizer or or, or Medtronic, maybe more. Um, and, and your investors will ask you, like, for whom are you designing this product? Of course, at the end of the day, it's called consultation. Um, but as an interim step, you really got to understand what, what is the data package that you need. Um, what many people do, and if you just sort of randomly look to the boards of biotech companies, they very often have people from pharma companies on their board. And that is one of the key reasons for that. Because you might have somebody who can give you the feedback and say, look, you're really going to drive that to a phase two randomized clinical trial before somebody will really go into this and before somebody will really put down the big dollars that you want from the company. Five lessons. Um, oops. So I think that, that's, that's really the key lesson. But it's, it's unbelievable. So if you, if you really have something that is cool and that you're passionate about, um, I think starting a company with professional experience. Or, for that matter, join a really small company. And small, for me, is probably under, under 30. There is typically sort of a certain dynamic that kicks in around 30, and then the next jump is around 100 people. So if you really want to have the real entrepreneurial experience with a company under 30, we can talk about a couple of criteria to find them, um, and you do your diligence that you are not standing there four months later um, with people you don't like, and the CEO says, in my way, next week, we have all the money. Um, we talked about the people. So if you're the CEO or if you're really involved, um, you're always in front of people. And, and that's sort of one of, one of the things that will always keep you away at night. And you always have to find ways, and you always have to look at the bank account and, and sort of calculate in your mind like how much time is left. So the average biotech company is financed for 24 months, maybe 36 if you're left. But that's it. And then from the day the financing is closed, you will have your bottle of champagne with all the advisors and the board, and then the clock is ticking. And the balance is going down, it's not going up. And so this is this is what you're gonna keep. Um, execution we talked about, customer we talked about. So th this is now if, if you were really determined to do this. This is sort of what, what I think are sort of all your top five milestones during the first 12 months. And nothing of what I, what I say here is, is sort of black or white. And if you get somebody else here to do a similar talk, they will tell you how it is. So there is no sort of right or wrong, and everything is somehow um, influenced by personal experiences, by, by time, like by now, biotech is really right. IPOs left and right, companies with public investors cash out, investors have an easy time to raise new funds. Right now, from a financing perspective, it looks, looks pretty good. Um, so I think that the top five milestones are you gotta get your core team of employees and advisors on board. Doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has signed an employment letter. I mean, there's a lot of flexibility here. People work, multiple jobs are consulting in between, and this and that. What what you have to have, if it is something coming out of the university, you gotta have this sort of uh, secured in some way. Doesn't mean that you already have to have the exclusive worldwide license from Stanford, but you at least have to have an option, an exclusive option, to this one point exclusive license. Because you can't shop around something that you don't really have or that you can't secure easily. Um, and you gotta understand what you actually have, how it all fits, and then the famous elevator pitch, the five minute pitch, the 30 minute pitch. And once you're there and you don't truly enjoy that, you know, because it's not getting easier or it's going to go through sort of the same loops many, many times. And, and I think it only makes sense if you really, truly enjoy it. And if you do, it's a great experience. But if not, get out. There's 
Frankia war da überhaupt in, in Biotech, in Pharma, in Law, like one of my best path interns that I ever worked with. Um, had a PhD in, uh, in biology, postdoc at Genentech, and then just said, look, this is not for me. Going to law school is a fantastic path. Um, lastly, anyone, if you want to do this. Questions? Challenges? <coughs> so, now, by halfway through your presentation, you mentioned that it's most important to find the right investors. For as both an investor and an entrepreneur, how do you think about the problem and what defines it actually? As an investor? Well, okay. so from both perspectives. Yeah. Well, I think a, a good investor is, is somebody who contributes more to the company than just one. It is somebody who will take a very active role on the board of directors who helps you to shape the, the strategy of the company, who helps you to make introductions to other investors, who helps you to make introductions to potential farmer partners, who's sort of almost like a player on your team, given that there is a sort of a certain oversight of that I think is, is a really cool thing. Um, they are often hard to find. There is unfortunately a number of people whom I would not consider to be for the home. It is, and, and I think many of them are also in a, in a sort of difficult position that it's it's a business model, right? They they raise money from pension funds or from, from other big institutions. They have maybe five hundred million dollars in their fund. It's a ten-year fund, so the expectation is that there is a whatever at least like threefold return out of this fund. They go through a lot of financial modeling. Oh, yeah, that, that's the other important thing I can say to you. If an investor says no, and you personalize it all, this has many, many reasons. And very often, it's just bad timing. Like if you come with an early stage uh, opportunity into a fund that is in the fifth year, they can't invest. It doesn't work out in terms of their financial model. Now, the, the problem is very often, that one needs to know these people reasonably well to really get the true answer. So what, what I have done very often in the past, um, when people say no, not in the meeting where the associates are around and this and that, but later it's like, hey Joe, um, not everybody spoke Joe with this industry, but um, <laughs> tell me why. Give me something that I can learn from and I can sort of move on. Is there a fundamental flaw in my technology that maybe I did appreciate? Or is the market too small? Or is the competition too fierce? Or whatever is it? Or is it just like, look, we have invested in 17 oncology companies, you come with an oncology play, we don't diversify. But why don't you talk to Jim? Because Jim is really looking for oncology. And it is. I, I think very often, and I also thought that at the beginning, that it's sort of a judgment on your science and your technology. I mean, that, that needs to be crystal clear and nice and all matching, but there's many, many other things that need to come uh, together in, in order to really secure an investment, in particular with the lead investor. So at the end of the day, you only need to convince one, the so called lead investor. And that investor will bring in the others. So you've talked before about not, you know, can't demand to be the CEO, the being the founder and then transitioning to another role. How often is that successful versus how often does that lead to internal tensions within the company that end up sort of from the interpersonal aspect of uh, sinking the company? Yeah, I, I can't give you sort of statistics or numbers on it. I mean, this, this thing is a difficult thing. And it doesn't mean that, um, I mean, look, look at the Google books. Right? I mean, under under biotech criteria, they were not funded. But hey, it's tech, it was a different time, and they did not do bad. Um, so it's not to say that no, let's say under 40 person with uh, first time entrepreneur cannot be CEO, but I think one needs to be open for that conversation to happen. And 
it can take all sorts of different shapes. And I have seen examples where it's like, look, we're giving you six months or 12 months. You get a professional coach and a business mentor, and then we'll talk about this again in 12 months. Or like some companies, look, look at some investment firms have uh, entrepreneurs and their business on their website. Both have perfect way to jump into the CEO. I mean, a lot of them are extremely experienced. If you get along with them, let's say as long as you still control the company, you can always say no. The, the condition of investment is that Paul jumps in as CEO, and you don't like Paul, you can also say no. You don't get the investment. But so jumping off that, you mentioned Google and you know, their failure as an essential biotech. So there's a lot, obviously a lot of di big differences between tech entrepreneurship and you know, life science entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. What do you see as kind of the major important differences? And then as we move forward into kind of the hybrids with like digital health yeah. and big data and all this thing, how do you see those two fields uh, yeah. overlapping? So I think the big differences are probability of technical success is so much lower in life sciences, right? If you have a couple of good engineers, software engineers, physicists together, they typically come up with something. Might not be the next invention of the wheel, but it is typically the product. The probability of pushing out a product is very high or somebody can get it. In tech, you typically don't have something ugly like the FDA in front of you to jump over. Um, and then uh, the third is the, uh, the capital requirements. And, and, and so in that sense, these like digital health business models are quite attractive. Now, they are also not sort of fully accepted out there in the marketing price, right? I just talked to one colleague today who had the Apple Watch and said, why in the hell did um, I want to have to say something bad about Facebook and then I have them all wrong. <laughs> um, can you stop that? <laughs> uh, so, I think those are the main differences, and, and it's again sort of on, on the risk equation a little bit. Yeah, digital health has a number of advantages, but it's also not really fully founded. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not an expert there, but I, I have a hard time to name a couple of companies that were successful in a sense of the product on the market, product reimbursed and accepted, and investors made money. Uh, um, so we, so our um, our idea was we we gonna have offerings for every stage in that whole process and for any kind of challenge that they might be. So starting with academic researchers. Um, working on something really cool, but we manage I mean, yeah. So we do a lot of contract research agreements where um, an academic group would then work uh, with them and they would put in the funding. Um, there is a joint steering committee that sort of designs the studies, manages the studies for um, We do R&D collaborations also with a lot of companies. So sort of, at, at the end of the day, same principle that um, we would provide the funding, that's a joint steering committee, science is being executed to some milestones events, and at those milestones events, um, we can uh, put them in by our. Um, that's sort of the R&D collaboration side. The, the second segment is, is corporate venture capital. So in the meantime, essentially, every single of the big company has a corporate venture fund. Ours is called AGVC. Uh, Johnson & Johnson Development Corporation, and so we make equity investments side by side with classic uh, venture capital guys. And, and I think in the last number of years, that activity has really sort of stepped up because the life science investors early stage suddenly disappeared, right? So from a big company perspective, it's suddenly, um, oh sure, if there is no new company being created and financed at some point, we don't have somebody to partner with. So a lot of resources were pushed in there. There's JGBC, there's SR1 from, uh, from 
to the scale of Roche Venture Fund, there's Lilly Venture, Medium Noon Venture, almost every single company has this on the device side as well, a little less, but they're starting now. Um, so that, that's sort of pillar number two. Number three is something called JLabs. It's how the money can be incubated. So it's the idea if an uh, entrepreneur start a company, they should really be able to focus on science and not on getting a license to operate a facility, having a receptionist, and deal with a lot of, let's say, administrative things. So we have um, facilities, one of them started off in San Diego, one of them is in, in Mission Bay, UCSF, one of them is uh, South San Francisco. We participate here at StarX, the Stanford uh, sponsored event. We have, we are in the process of opening one in Houston. And the idea is companies can apply, there is a selection process that looks at somewhat similar aspects like investors would I mean, we want to have a company that survives or has a chance to survive and his management to use on this course. But importantly, it's a no strings to have business model. So JJ does not hold any equity or any product rights in the company. We incubate them, we help them uh, to grow. So those are sort of the three main mechanisms. Thanks for asking the question, as now I could put in on JJ pitch. <laughs> <laughs> So, when it comes to, I guess, this goes a bit between um, the customers as well as the investors. When you're looking, uh, when you're pitching your idea, chances are your, your customers are going to end up being a larger company as opposed to you winning this market on your own. But when you go to uh, a venture firm and say, you know, here's our market size, can you tell them, like, our goal is to be acquired and to have this mm -hmm. be sort of a, a smaller segment? Yeah. And, does that show the same kind of um, drive and commitment that they might be looking for for something they're going to give a whole bunch of money to? Um, well, I mean, there is quite a lot of companies, in particular in the, in the more recent years, that, that went into orphan diseases. And they did that very successfully. Now, you got to have a certain number of patients to even be medically relevant, to be able to, to sort of do your studies and do it. A disease where there's 100 patients worldwide, that's probably not the right business model. Um, but often diseases were very popular, plus sort of buzzword personalized medicine. Um, very often people appreciate it even more if you have a very clear idea, like I'm going after whatever triple negative breast cancer that has the following parameters around it, or I am going whatever into a frontal temporal dementia with the idea of jumping into Alzheimer's disease later on. It, it sort of all depends. And, and also, venture as a whole is not the same, right? I mean, the, the idea that one venture fund loves, um, the other one may hate. And you get, I mean, I have got always very sort of opposing advice of like, well, you gotta focus more. Okay, so then you will work your slides, you go to Paul, the next day, and Paul says, oh, you never think much bigger. And so that's where, I mean, you're constantly sort of triangulating somehow to satisfy your audience to a certain extent without sort of selling your soul. Right? Great, I think we can wrap up now. So let's just thank Paul for coming up here.